Right, so um, thank you first of all for having me here. Um, I'm always interested to talk about our work, so I hope also to get a lot of questions from you. I tend to talk a lot, so if you have a question during my presentation, feel free to jump in. Um, so um, I never think about titles, and Thomas asked me to put a title to this. Um, so I, I decided to, to put getting people talking in it. On the one hand, to get people to engage with the information that we publish through these video abstracts, but on the other hand also, it's very nice for us to get the people that are actually writing the information in the in the publish, uh, published articles that we do um, to get them to engage more with their actual audience. Um, so my name is Maarten Kleuren. I'm Director of Product Management for Enriched Content at Elsevier. Um, so for all of the journals that we publish and push out on our outlets, we have various, but Science Direct is the one that probably most of you use. Um, we enrich that content through various means, and I'll talk a bit about that. Um, so this is my agenda for the day. I'll, I'll tell you something about Elsevier very briefly, just to give you an overview. Um, I'll tell you something about enrichments in general, what we can do with articles and what we allow um, authors to do with articles. I'll talk a bit about video abstracts and what I think works from experience and what I think doesn't work. Um, and then I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. And like I said, if you have any questions, just feel free to jump in. Um, so we've, we've been around for a while. Um, we started publishing first in, uh, in 1500s. Uh, one of our most famous publications from that time was, uh, was Galileo's Two New Sciences, um, which we still actually publish. Um, and then we've, we've transformed the business over the years. So um, the Elsevier family started publishing initially. Uh, then there was a bit of a hiatus when they ceased publishing. And then Elsevier, as the company as it now is, was formed at about 1880. Um, and then began international scientific publishing only in 1930. So um, although we've been around for a long time, actually starting to publish scientific materials on a journal basis, um, we've only done that since 1931. Um, we then merged with Reed International um, in 1993, and then we changed our company name into something that is unpronounceable uh, in 2015. Um, so when our CEO announced that, he said it's going to be a lot easier to explain that you work for Relx um, as opposed to working for Reed Elsevier. Um, it's a matter of opinion, I guess. Um, so this is our mission, um, and I decided to put it in. It's a bit lofty, but anyway, a company needs a mission. So we want to make sure that we lead the way um, in advancing science, technology, and health. Um, that sounds a bit lofty, but essentially this is our CEO right here. It means we have the responsibility to create highly effective solutions that enable our customers to level the vast potential of information. Um, so if you look at where we were in the 1930s, we were mostly a publisher. If you look at where we are now, we are starting to become more of an information solution solutions provider. So we, we publish uh, information and that's why most people know us, uh, especially if you talk to the people in the open access movement, that's why most people know us. Um, but we also do all of this. Right? So we have a lot of database products, we have a lot of information products that exceed what we do with publication. Um, I won't make it a product pitch. Um, they're available online. Maybe the library has some of them available. Um, they're mostly information products in the life sciences, engineering, and essentially in the STEM publishing business. Um, for example, we have something called Pathway Studio that allows you to excerpt and look at disease pathways. Uh, we have something like Clinical Key, which is focused on clinicians, so that uh, assembles all of our clinical information and indexes it for easy search. So I'll tell you something about enrichments. Um, so in 1997, we uh, launched Science Direct, which was is still our, our big platform and was the one of the first biggest platforms that publishers launched to electronically make available that information. So it's only been a short while that we've been promoting our, our information in a more electronic format. Um, it only was in 2009 that we started considering the fact that we moved a print medium onto an electronic platform and we didn't really have the capabilities to fulfill essentially all the possibilities that you have with moving to an online environment. So the article information that we were publishing was still relatively PDF format style and even the HTML version of that was relatively PDF format style. So in 2009 we launched something called the article of the future. Um, with which we try to make it more accessible to researchers to upload next to their article any other information that they might have at their disposal. Um, and not only do that as supplementary data files, but do more with it. So we wanted to make sure that we allowed people to do more article enrichment style information. 
Um, we've we clustered that around a couple of sectors. Um, so we have something called interactive data viewers that allow you, for example, to have a plottable graph next to it. So it allows the um, the the, uh, the person reading your article, especially on the HTML version, to plot your graph um, while they're reading it. Um, we allow things about article presentation. So essentially, the way that you want to present your article has been more flexible on the online platforms. Um, we have context and reference tools. So we do a lot of text mining ourselves. Um, that also allows us, for example, if there are antibodies in an article, to link through to a database that has the antibody information in the database. So we make sure that for some information that's relevant to publishers, mostly in the life sciences sector, I must admit, um, to link through to additional contextual information. Um, and then we allow people to do multimedia. Um, and that's mostly where I guess uh, the talk that, we, th that you invited me to do today is about. Um, we have multiple multimedia formats, and I'll talk a bit about that. Um, some of the cool things that we do, we have something called 3D model viewers, um, which allow you to upload 3D um, mul essentially multimedia files um, that allow a user on the web page actually to toggle the um, 3D models and to actually go in and zoom in and zoom out. Um, like I said before, we have um, the antibodies possibility, so we do a lot of text mining ourselves. Um, we request that people uh, enter accession numbers, for example, for genome databases. Um, and then we do something called case insights. So we're, we're trying to, uh, to get a sort of a Pokemon Go feel for, uh, for all of our content, which is very difficult, but we, we try to make it more um, uh, we, we try to engage people essentially more with the articles. So for our medical publications at the moment, people have the capability or are requested to upload questions that are relevant to their article so that people can test whether or not they've understood um, the message in the article itself. So these are some of the things we do. I'm happy to talk about all of that during the break because we have about 30 different enrichments available at the moment. Um, what we do have with that and what that does mean is that um, because we want to make sure that whatever thing you give us is actually uh, replicable on the online platform. We want to make sure that whatever we put on also makes it to the platform in a way that you are um, wanting it to go there. So we've developed some authoring tools that come with that that allow you, to, for example, to upload a graph um, that is actually interactive in our site. And that means that we have to put some restrictions on that in terms of what you can upload, in terms of the decimals, for example, that you can upload. But that also means that we've had to develop some tools that allow you to do that. Um, and that also has a bearing on the video abstract piece. And then finally, um, the piece I wanted to say about enrichments is that um, when we started thinking more about what would make sense for people to publish, for some disciplines, it actually doesn't make sense to publish in an article format anymore. Um, so there are video journals out there like Jove, and we also have them here. Uh, in this case, um, gastrointestinal endoscopy, and I've blanked out some of the images because they're pretty gruesome. Um, all of the articles in this journal are video articles. They're fully video articles. So there is some metadata there that allows you to search for them and allows you to find them in databases, but essentially the information that you're getting is in full video format. And as you can see, there's also a video abstract. So we have video abstracts of videos. Uh, I guess. So talking about video abstracts then. Um, I guess the most, oh, I'll get my water there, the most important people for, um, the most important reason for people to, to create um, a video abstract is they want to broadcast their research and people want to broadcast their research in many ways. Um, so we want to make sure that we, um, we do that in a way that's effective. The reason why we want to make that effective is that we've, we know from all of the people that we serve that essentially researchers are becoming more and more busy. They need to do all these things, right? So they need to get funding, collaborate with people in their network, they need to experiment and do analysis of the data that they've gathered, they need to manage that data somewhere, um, they need to publish and disseminate that, commercialize it, promote their research and actually get get a, an impact on society with some of the things that they do. Um, so that means that they are more and more busy. Um, so what we want to do with all of the tools that we develop, with all of the capabilities that we have, is to re reduce some of that workload. Um, promoting research is, is a th something that you can readily do by going to conferences, again, which takes out a large piece of your time. Publishing already is promoting your research. For us, the video abstract piece is very much one of those assets as well. It's a capability that allows you to promote your research in a way that doesn't require that you're everywhere at the same time. 
Um, again, video can be a very powerful thing, right? So if you put a video online, it's very easy to disseminate. There are huge amounts of platforms that allow you to do so. Um, I haven't seen a video abstract that actually has 2 billion views, but um, maybe we'll get there at one point. Um, it does allow you to connect more personally with, uh, with the audience that you're writing for. Um, and that is something, I guess, that for us is, is a very key feature, and it also makes it very difficult. Um, not everyone is accustomed to presenting in a way or to presenting on video. Um, so although we want to make sure that we have people connect personally to their audience, we want to do that in a way that suits them best. Um, so that means that for some things, we actually, uh, for some publications, and this is a link again, and I'm not even going to try to open it, um, because that's always a bad rule of presenting. We have sort of Steven Spielberg-like um, uh, videos. So th this one starts with someone rushing down the stairs, and it's all very, there's a sound to it, and it's very, uh, it's very bombastic. And then we have people in very nice HD uh, um, video that are talking about their article. So we, we make that a production. And for some journals that actually want to invest in that and promote their top articles, we create video abstracts using a third party. They're highly productionized, so they're actually, they look quite good, and they get a lot of views. Um, the difficulty, and I'll get into a bit of that as well, with a lot of the video abstracts that people create themselves is around how do you make a video that's actually watchable to people. Right? It's the same thing with the word cloud. Uh, a lot of people started using word clouds in their information. Most word clouds that I've seen are pretty useless. They don't really tell you anything. Um, so you need to make sure that whatever you're bringing across in a video is as equally telling as what is in your article. Um, so uh, apologies for the, the I, I used a font that apparently doesn't really work on the, uh, on the presentation mode here. Um, so the reason why you want to actually do a video abstract um, can be multivaried, right? So we have a reason for it to put it online, uh, but as, a, as an author, you also have a reason for it. One of the big reasons that's becoming more and more important is essentially the, the effect that you have on society by doing the research that you're doing. One of the ways that you can use a video abstract is to make it more ap applicable to a generic audience. So some of the videos that you will see online are actually not really interesting for scientists, they're more interesting for a lay public. So there's a big difference if you pres put something in there for a lay public or if you're wanting to do this for a more scientific public. So socializing is one of the big reasons why people do this. Um, the biggest reason why people do it is to promote their own research to the audience that they're already engaged with, uh, which essentially means scientists. And I guess that if I look at everything that we have available, um, this is the best, I guess this is the biggest reason why people want to do a video abstract or anything else. Um, I, I saw, for example, and I don't think it was Wiley, I think it was uh, Taylor and Francis has the capability now to produce something like a, a, a comic abstract which is essentially just a drawn comic, which is very cool. Um, but that more targets the lay audience. For the stuff that we do, they mostly target a scientific audience. Um, one of the reasons it's interesting for us is that a lot of people use these actually to review whether or not an article is of interest to them in total. So they use it a lot in the same way that they use a normal abstract or use article highlights is to browse whether or not this information is of any interest to them at all uh, and do a quick review. Um, so. When we thought about all of this and how best to do this, we released something called Featured Author Videos, which essentially is basically uh, something that you would call a video abstract. Um, so it's this. So you see here uh, an article from Science Direct, and on the bottom end here you see someone talking about their video. Um, and this is someone that essentially just recorded a video using the webcam on their laptop. Now, what we found from that is that the uptake of that wasn't particularly high. So we now have about 112 in total. Um, to give that a bit of perspective, we publish 300,000 articles a year. Um, so over the course of having released this, which has now been a couple of years old, that's not really a lot. What we also found is that uh, mathematicians love blackboards a lot. Um, the, the reason that's become so important for me is that they treat it almost as a video article. So a lot of people are using the, the author videos almost to create a new article. Um, the reasons why mathematicians love it so much is that they want to stand in front of a blackboard and draw on it, and that's the best way to bring across their information. So of all of the videos that we have, um, almost 80, so a huge percentage of it is from one journal, the Journal of Number Theory. Um, so in the mathematical community, this is huge, or, well, not huge, but at least bigger than in any other community. Um, the difficulty mostly we had with this, and when I looked at all these videos, is that the quality level of them is relatively poor. 
So I'm very happy to learn that you have a media lab here. A lot of people that are doing these recordings are recording it either using their phone or using a webcam or using a very low grade um, camera. That means that the sound quality is usually really poor. Um, so we're happy to put, we're not happy to put anything out essentially. Um, we're happy to boot a lot out, but if the sound quality is relatively poor, um, we find that people that are using these types of things are not going to be likely to use them again. So the stuff that we want to put online, hopefully for us also, we need to make sure that it's relatively okay. Um, so quality is a big aspect for us. So we have these hugely produced videos. Quality of them are huge and it's fantastic and they're, u they're used a lot. For the videos that we've put online there, it's not being used a lot. Um, one of the things you spoke about, I have no experience with this, that goes for a lot of people. A lot, not, not everyone records a video in their own time, so um, I guess the YouTube generation does that, but scientists gen generally don't do that. Um, so we wanted to come with, up with a solution that, that is closer to where scientists are in their daily lives. Um, we also don't want this to be peer-reviewed. Um, the reason for doing that is that, um, as you also said, you did it post-acceptance, we can only ask authors to do so much on submission. So we don't want to include t this type of information at the submission process because that requires that people do a lot at, at submission and we get in about, maybe we turn down 60% of the articles that we get in on a yearly basis, so that means for a lot of people that they're doing actually something that doesn't really reap any fruits. So we don't want it peer-reviewed. We're also not moderating any of the content. So that also means that anything you want to put online in the video abstract, I don't see what's in it. There is a button there that allows you to say this is improper content in it, but we're not moderating it in any way. Um, which for, you know, for any company that puts this on their website is a difficult proposition to make because um, although a lot of people love us, there's also uh, some people that don't love us. Um, you never know what people are going to put online. So. We decided to come up with a different concept. So a lot of the video abstract materials that we have are something called audio slides, which um, is closer to where we felt scientists are because a lot of people that are writing research are actually also presenting that research at various conferences. So we wanted to come up with a combination of a video abstract and an audio slide set that allowed people to reuse a lot of the stuff that they'd already done by presenting at conferences um, in a way that, um, that creates more, uh, more visibility to them. So um, what that essentially means is that you take a couple of slides, you narrate those slides in a way that makes sense with the article, and that is what we put online. Um, that's something that uh, now is available in the same way that we had the author videos. So you can see one here at the bottom right corner. Um, it gives you the capability to do more. It's between zero and five minutes, so you can record a very short one, you can record a longer one. Um, to your question whether or not these are copyrighted, these aren't. So these are available to anyone, you can put them anywhere. It uh, doesn't really matter to me. That's also the reason why we put them on there, to promote stuff. So they're, they're open accessible. Um, they're available on any social media channel. Or at least you can put them there. We don't. Um, that's up to the researcher because this is a tool for them to promote their research. Um, what we also did is that we wanted to make sure that uh, we create the capability for people to create these things themselves in a way that makes sense. So we developed a tool bench. So as soon as your article is accepted at Elsevier, you'll get a request to create a set of audio slides with that article. Um, there's a link in that email that will bring you to this tool bench, which is unique to your article. Um, so although we don't moderate content, we wanted to make sure that not everyone can just upload whatever to our site because the, the um, actual video is also next to the article. Um, so that means that these links are unique. As soon as you are accepted, the DOI will, will give you the opportunity to, uh, to come into this tool bench and start creating an article, uh, a, a slide set. It's, it's relatively easy. All you need is a microphone uh, and a set of slides. You upload a slide, you narrate that piece of the slide, you upload a new slide, you narrate that piece of the slide. Um, the actual benefit of that is, is that, um, and that's in one of my further comments, but it makes more sense to say it now, is that, the difficulty with video material as opposed to an abstract is that if I read an abstract, I can browse through it very quickly and see whether or not something is relevant for me. It takes me maybe 10 seconds. It's very difficult to do that with video. 
Um, an added benefit of this as well is, is that most people that are doing this use a transcript. So uh, the transcript is readily available. So we now have about 6,000 of those. So the uptake of that is a lot better than it actually is for the, for the featured all the videos that we did. Um, that doesn't always mean that it's the right tool to use, um, but the way that we've engaged with the people that have, have, have started doing this process, although um, they've also found it to be difficult at times, it's definitely not perfect, but we're, we're trying to come to a solution that makes it very easy for people to uh, promote their information and promote their articles. Um, and again, we request them to promote them as much as they can. So you're free to upload that to YouTube. Um, we're doing a contest at the moment where we're trying to find the best audio slide set in the area of neuroscience. Um, we've posted those on the YouTube channel as well. Um, and the, the one that has the most uh, hits to it wins. Routinely, you would see that um, these author videos get viewed somewhere between 50 to 100 times. Um, for the ones that we have in the contest now, we're already going towards the thousand. So we're actually doing OK for something that's relatively niche um, and this is a, this is an example of that so uh, this one actually already has eight, 800 views you can share these on Twitter you can do whatever with them what we also found and this is I guess very important that also something you alluded to and we have so I have actual statistical evidence for that if you do an audio slide set with your article it tends to get downloaded more and viewed more so it actually does attract an audience towards your article now I don't know what that audience is I don't know whether or not that would be people that are already in your community or whether or not those are people that are slightly outside your community but scientists or whether or not those are laymen I presume the latter won't be the case, but you never know. Um, but we do see that usage um, increases um, with the availability of it. The difficulty with it is that conveying information in a video is very different from text. Um, so you do find that um, we have a lot of videos in there that if, if I were to watch them, I'm definitely not an expert in every field that we have within Elsevier. I'm a philosopher, so um, I'm definitely not an ex expert in any field that we publish in because we don't publish any philosophy. Um, it's, very different, it's a different way of promoting your information. What you see a lot is that people treat essentially the audio slide presentation or the video abstract in, in a way that they would also write. Um, and that doesn't really make a video an appealing thing to do. So depending on the use that you want to make of it, if you want to target it for a layman audience, the slide set that you're doing or the video that you're doing, the content of that needs to be suitable for an audience. I could spend my talk here today showing you all this XML and code that we have behind the scenes. It doesn't really matter to you. So the way that you put up your talk needs to be uh, appropriate to the audience. And the same thing goes for, for conveying information in video. It's just very different from text. Um, and there's no such thing like browsing a video. And that's, that's I guess, a difficulty. So the, the reason why we've put the audio slides on is that makes it easier for the user to browse because you can jump from one slide to the next and start at the new slide. So even if you don't want to have any of the narration under it, you can browse through the videos and get a very quick understanding, or, or the slides and get a very quick understanding of what is actually in the article. Finally, um, we are very committed to making all of the content that we have accessible to everyone. So that also means that the difficulty for us to put multimedia content up is that it doesn't have any closed captioning usually. It doesn't have any transcripts with it. So um, we want to come to a solution where all the video and multimedia content that we have on our platform, and that includes podcasts or audio samples or videos, um, are closed captioned um, or have a transcript with them so that people that are blind can actually still use the information that's in this content. Um, we also don't want to have our authors pay for any of that, so all of the services that I showed you today are free. Um, the tools are free to use. Once you publish with Elsevier, you can go into this and use it and do with what you want with them. Um, but this is a costly business also for us. If we want to make it accessible, it's something that's difficult for us. The advantage of doing the audio slides here again, and that's the reason why I like it so much and why I like to promote it, is that a lot of people that do a slide set and a lot of people that present present from a set of um, a written down document, essentially. They use a transcript. You can actually hear people turning pages on the, video, on the audio slides, which is quite funny. So I know that they're using a transcript. So we're starting to ask people to upload with this their transcript so that we can use it to make it more accessible to the fullest group of our users. That was what I wanted to tell you. I hope that makes sense. Um, I'm open to any questions.
concerning the uh, audio slides, do you also allow there for video presentations? Because there are certain material, it could be uh, from some experiments, but it could also be some simulation results you would like to, uh, you cannot present as a video in the paper, but you can do it, for example, in a, uh, what you call an audio slide. So. So, so, so there's two things to that. So we actually do allow you to present them in the paper. So there is an opportunity if you have, for example, a demo of something or to show a video of a process to upload it as part of your article. But then the way that we publish it, it really becomes part of the article. So it goes through the peer review process. You upload it as a supplementary data file. Um, we've not been good in the past at making sure that that gets embedded in the article in the way that you want. So if you, if you saw my screen just now, we're, we still have a three-pane window where you have a, a table of contents on the left-hand side, the article in the middle, and then all of the nice stuff around the edges. We're moving to a new article view where everything is embedded in the article itself. So we are generating the capability to, if you have a video, to actually just upload that as part of the article. Um, that does mean, obviously, that because a lot of the content we still publish is subscription-based. If it's subscription-based and you don't have access to it, you don't have access to that video material. The capability with audio slides is not, it, it doesn't allow you easily to upload video or do, uh, do any type of animation. You would basically do the animation as you would do it normally in a, in a slide presentation. So we do have still the capability to upload a video as you would normally do using the featured author videos. So we, we, we try to, to make it as easy as possible, but it's definitely not as flexible as we may want it to be fully. Does that Thank answer your question? Yes, it answers. Thanks. OK. Was I that clear? <laughs> Apparently, or it has to sink in before all the questions start to pop out. Uh